So in the last video, we talked about um, sort of forest types at the very broad scale, the global scale, and the different kinds of forests we have in different places. In this video, I want to focus in, as we will for the rest of the semester, really focus in on North America. And uh, we're going to talk about um, the two freeze-hardy forests, right? The two forests that, that experience um, change of seasons and that can tolerate freezing. Uh, and that's the boreal forest and the temperate forest. So here's a map of the boreal forests. So we have boreal forests in both North America and Eurasia, and it's circumpolar in its distribution, basically around the pole south of the um, Arctic tundra. Um, so let's talk about the different taxa that dominate the, the boreal forest. So there's, there's far fewer species in boreal forests than there are in temperate forests, and there are fewer species in temperate forests than there are in tropical forests. Um, but uh, we do have a, a, a fair number of fairly interesting genera. Uh, so the first genera we're going to talk about uh, here, or the first genus we're going to talk about here is Picea, and that's spruce. There's several species of spruce in both the Old World and New World boreal forest. Um, they're the most widespread genus. It's the most uh, common and, and widespread tree uh, tree genus in um, in the boreal forest. Uh, they're just they're abundant pretty much everywhere except eastern Siberia, where it's really dry. We'll talk about Siberia in a, in a little bit here, and they're adapted to basically very cold, wet conditions. So where you have especially where you have permafrost and you don't have good drainage in the soil, right? So with permafrost, uh, the upper layer of soil thaws out in the summer uh, and freezes in the winter, but, but at a certain depth, when you go below, the soil is permanently frozen. And so what that means is if you have permanently frozen soil, that top layer stays pretty wet because there's nowhere for the water to drain. And this is where spruce really, really excel. Uh, so in North America, our most common species are Picea glauca, which is white spruce, and Picea mariana, which is black spruce. Uh, in Eurasia, we've got Norway spruce and Siberian spruce and some other species as well. Um, the key sort of adaptation to this, to this cold, wet uh, conditions, spruce have very shallow and spreading root systems. Uh, they have some plasticity in their root depth, right? So if, if conditions allow, they can, they can develop deeper roots. But in general, their roots are pretty shallow in that sort of in just that area of soil that thaws out. Uh, there's no sense in trying to build roots down into the permafrost. Um, they can tolerate acidic soils, which most um, most boreal forests are. And um, again, those soils don't drain very well. They're very waterlogged, uh, and so they can tolerate that as well. Black spruce on the on the right here, Picea mariana, is is really really well adapted to those really waterlogged soils, and you'll find them in the in the wettest parts of the boreal forest. You find them in bogs. Um, here's the distribution of some, some spruce species, so Picea glauca, as I, as I said, white spruce is basically distributed all across the boreal zone of North America, from uh, the maritime provinces of Canada all the way up to Alaska. Uh, the most widespread and abundant spruce species in um, Eurasia is Picea abius, or um, Norway spruce, and again, you can see it uh, in the Alps all the way out into Siberia. Um, another species, um, or another genus, is uh, Abies. Uh, in North America, we call it Abies. In, in Europe, they call it Abies. But it's the, it's the same thing, and that's fur. Um, now, fur is really only found in North America. Uh, there's not, uh, we don't see fur in the boreal forests of Eurasia. Uh, you do see it in the montane and the temperate zones of Eurasia, but not in the boreal zone. Um, uh, they're a little less tolerant of those waterlogged, poorly drained soils. Um, and they're less tolerant of fire than spruce. Uh, so you find them on uh, better drained sites um, and sites that don't burn quite as, quite as often. Uh, they're more tolerant of dry soil. Um, and uh, the, the main species we see are balsam fir in eastern North America and subalpine fir in western North America. Um, so here's, uh, so Abies balsamea is, uh, is balsam fir, and you can see it's mostly in eastern North America, here on the, uh, uh, you know, in Quebec and the northeastern United States. It goes a little bit out into uh, the sort of western Canada. Uh, and then uh, we've got two species. They used to be lumped. They were all 
They used to be Abies lasiocarpa, but the, the genus has been split into two species, Abies lasiocarpa and Abies bifolia. And this is a, sort of our western uh, subalpine fir that we find in the mountains and boreal zone of western North America. Lasiocarpa is generally the, the species that you find on the, on the west, and bifolia is the species that we find in the, in the interior in the drier sites. Um, another important boreal forest taxa is larch, Larix. Um, this is Larix occidentalis, which is um, we find in, in North America. Um, and this uh, larch is a really interesting conifer. It's conifer, uh, it's, um, it, it's got needles for leaves and produces cones, but it's deciduous. Um, and the reason it's deciduous, it's adapted to the really cold, dry sites. So um, it's really the dominant genus in Siberia. And Siberia is the part of the boreal forest that's super, super dry, very cold and very dry with extremely short growing season. And so the adaptation that larch has to those conditions is that it loses its needles because remember, uh, if you have needles or you have leaves, uh, you've got You've got stomata, you've got pores in those leaves, and that's that's where you're going to lose a lot of moisture, you're going to lose a lot of water. Uh, so if you drop your leaves, you eliminate that uh, water loss. So uh, they're very well adapted to the dry uh, boreal forest. Um, so what these, what larch do is they grow very rapid, um, very thin, very disposable needles. Right, so spruce and fir and pine have those really thick, chunky needles. is a big um, biological investment in in the machinery of photosynthesis. There, a lot of biomass. It would it would not be advantageous to just throw those away. So large needles are very thin, and uh, they don't put as much um, don't put as much energy and as much biomass into them. So then, at the end of the very short growing season, they can drop them, and then grow new ones the the next year. Um, so adapted to very dry conditions and very short growing season. Um, here's a couple of the major large uh, large species. So Larx larcinia, uh, tamarisk uh, in um, Canada and the northern United States, and then uh, Larx siberica, Siberian larch, uh, and you see in, in the sort of driest that interior Eurasia, you know, so Siberia and parts of northern China and Mongolia. Um, the driest part of the boreal forest in Eurasia. Okay, let's talk about pine. So in some parts of the boreal forest, we have some uh, very abundant pine species. So here's two of them. So Pinus banksiana on the left is jack pine, and Pinus contorta on the right is lodgepole pine. And these are adapted to our, our very fire-prone parts of the boreal forest. Boreal forests burn, and they burn big. Um, so when, when boreal forests burn, we're talking about very extensive uh, fires that kill lots of trees, and then um, the pines are adapted to sort of uh, re-sprout after fire and establish sort of these, these uh, uniform stands, uh, uniform age stands. Uh, another pine species in Eurasia of the boreal forest is, is Scots pine. Um, uh, another uh, another adaptation of, of pines is really, really high genetic variability, which helps them have sort of a really wide range, right? If you have high genetic variability, you have a higher likelihood that you're going to, that, that some genotype is going to be able to establish and persist in a location. Uh, so pines are really widely distributed. So here's some of the major pines of the boreal forest. So uh, jack pine, Pinus banksiana, is sort of an eastern to uh, middle western species across a lot of Canada. Uh, the, you see it in the Great Lakes states and uh, up in the northeast. Uh, Pinus contorta, lodgepole pine, that's the western pine of the, uh, of the boreal forest. You see it in uh, western Canada and the Rocky Mountains. And um, down here, oh, Pinus sylvestris. This is this is Scots pine, uh, which is the dominant pine species of the boreal forest in Eurasia. Okay, also in the boreal forest we have um, Betula, which is birch, and Populus, which is uh, poplar or aspen. Um, and so these these often grow with spruce and fir. Uh, they can also grow into into drier climates. 
Uh, both birch and aspen uh, are what we consider pioneer species. So again, boreal forests burn and they burn big extensive areas. Uh, both birch and aspen have very small seeds that can, can travel long distances on the wind. They can seed into those burned up patches and establish. Um, Birches, uh, they expanded uh, quite a lot from, from glacial refugia and populations uh, merged to form a, a complex of a lot of different species um, from these sort of separate uh, events in between glaciations. So uh, papyrifera, we have uh, paper birch, uh, pubescens, and varicosa. Uh, same, same kind of thing in aspens. Uh, the, the most abundant aspen species is, is tremuloides, but we also have uh, Davidiana and Rotundifolia. Um, and then here's some, some range maps. So again, uh, really widespread and kind of overlapping ranges of both birch and aspen. So here's uh, paper birch, that sort of white barked birch you see all across the boreal zone, uh, and aspen the same kind of thing. Notice aspen kind of drops down here into the Rocky Mountains a little more than birch does. Um, and the most uh, abundant sort of boreal birch in, um, in Eurasia is Betula pubescens, which is all across the boreal zone of Eurasia. Okay, so let's talk about temperate forests. Um, so these are the freeze-hardy uh, forests between the boreal forests and the frost-free, the tropical forests and subtropical forests. Um, all the forests uh, south of the tropical forests in the southern hemisphere. So we see some temperate forests again down here in southern South America, in um, the southern tip of Africa, and then the southern regions of Australia and in New Zealand. Um, and there's there's a lot of disjunct forest communities here, you know, separated by oceans and deserts and so on. We can see the sort of patchy distribution, um, but what, what you will notice is there's a lot more similarity going east-west, especially in the northern hemisphere where we have more land, and then the forests of the southern hemisphere are quite different, very different genera, uh, even different families of, of trees in southern hemisphere versus the, the north. So let's talk about the dominant taxa of the temperate zone. Um, again, similar to the boreal forests, uh, pine is really important. Um, but it's way more diverse in the in the temperate forest than in the boreal forest. A lot more uh, species. Um, pine is one of the most gener uh, most diverse genera of of trees in the world. About a hundred species. Uh, and again, we talked about they were in the boreal forest, and they go to just south of the equator, maybe about seven degrees or so south. Uh, Sumatran pine, Pinus mercusii, is the southernmost pine. We don't have any native pines you know, in the, in the southern hemisphere temperate forests. Um, this, uh, this handsome fellow over here is coring a, uh, a Pinus mercusii on Sumatra in Indonesia, one of the southernmost, uh, southernmost pines. Um, pines are super important for humans, uh, for timber, for fiber, um, naval stores. So we're talking about turpentine there. Um, uh, pines are very important for, um, you know, wood preservatives and a lot of products like that and have been for a very long time. Pines are adapted to dry sites. Uh, they have, they can grow very deep roots and they're very uh, fire adapted. We'll talk about the difference between uh, hard pines and soft pines, but even the soft pines or the white pines are, um, are fire adapted. Um, they're shade intolerant, so pines have to establish in sun. Uh, they can't really grow in the understory. They won't establish in the understory in the shade of other trees. Uh, and they have heavy seeds, so they don't disperse too far. Um, so there's two main types of pines. So the soft pines are uh, five needle pines. So every, every pine, we'll, we'll look at this on the arboretum, um, but pines have needles that, that occur in clusters, right? And, and they're, they're joined with a, a feature called a fascicle. Um, and different numbers of needles will, will originate from each fascicle. So all of our soft pines or our white pines are, have five needles. Those needles are typically uh, relatively thin and soft. And these are the most mesophytic of the pines. So they're adapted to sort of the wettest sites uh, of, of all pines. Uh, they occur in the northern part of the temperate zone in the northern hemisphere and some really common ones, eastern white pine, western white pine, sugar pine, 
uh, foxtail and bristlecone pines. Here's a picture of a sugar pine, Pinus lambertiana, in the Sierra Nevada of California. Uh, here's some other five needle uh, white pines. So Pinus strobus is eastern white pine. Uh, you can see those sort of soft um, uh, five needles. Uh, Pinus monticola is western white pine, which we find mostly in the in the Sierra Nevada and Cascades. Um, and then we've got hard pines. And so hard pines or yellow pines, um, they differ a little bit from, from the white pines in that they have sort of chunkier, stiffer needles, thicker needles. Um, those needles are groups in groups of two or three. Um, they're more xerophytic than the soft pines, so they're um, adapted to drier sites. Um, the closed cone pines, so things like, um, like lodgepole pine, their cones are closed and they only open after the heat of, of fire. Uh, they're the most fire adapted because they re-sprout or they sprout from seed after fire. Um, the, the sort of most common ones in North America, um, in the Western North America, ponderosa pine, lodgepole pine, Jeffrey pine. In Eastern North America, red pine, um, loblolly pine, shortleaf pine, longleaf pine, slash pine are, are uh, the dominant pines of the Southeast. Um, there's many, many species, as I said, there's uh, over a hundred species. Um, the most diversity of pines is in Mexico. Uh, the mountains of Mexico has the highest diversity of pines in the world. Uh, many, many species there. This is a picture of a, um, a table mountain pine. So this is another, this is a closed cone pine. Um, that cone, you can see the, the, the scales on that cone are, are really are tightly shut. Um, they'll only open uh, after a fire. So a fire will, will melt some waxes that are holding those uh, cone scales closed. Uh, the cone opens after the fire, the seeds drop out onto a nice mineral seed bed after everything else is burned up. Um, another important taxa uh, is Quercus or oak. And I like to think of, of oak as the angiosperm equivalent of pines. They have a really wide ecological amplitude. That means they can occur across a really wide range of sites, just like pines. So from pretty wet to very, very dry, uh, they can resist fire. Um, they, can, um, they can occur uh, everywhere and they're very species rich. There's lots of different species of, of oaks, uh, more than four, 500 species worldwide. <clears throat> Um, they're very tolerant of fire. Uh, they have, you know, fire resistant bark. They can also re-sprout uh, after fire from the root collar. Um, and they're a little more, uh, they, they are pretty shade intolerant, but they're more tolerant of shade than pines. So uh, in, in forest succession, if you have a big fire or some big disturbance, you usually get pines first. They have to establish um, in, in the open, in the sun and then you'll get oaks uh, coming in after that, and then you'll get more shade tolerant trees after that. Um, here's some uh, examples of some oaks in uh, California. So we have these beautiful California oak woodlands with uh, blue oak and black oak, uh, Quercus calagi and, and Douglasii. Um, and you see these in these sort of uh, rolling hills with, with a lot of grass. Um, some other really dominant species in the in the temperate deciduous forest, uh, Fagus, which is beech, and Acer, which is maple. Uh, so these are a little, these are different from oak and pine in that they're more shade tolerant, so they can establish under uh, can, uh, under canopy trees in the shade and kind of grow slowly in the shade until they can eventually ascend into the canopy. Um, and they're, and they're tolerant of much more wet sites than, uh, than oak and pine. Uh, so we find these in cooler, wetter sites uh, in the Northeast, in the Great Lakes states, in Canada, sort of our northern forest types. Uh, and there's about seven or eight species of beech worldwide, but um, beech, uh, the, the, um, the, the most common species is uh, the, the um, Fagus grandifolia, the American beech. Uh, with maple, there's uh, more than 70 species. Uh, worldwide, lots of different uh, dominant species in North America. Um, here's an interesting maple from Western North America. This is Acer grandidentatum, or big tooth maple, right? Grandidentatum, big tooth. Uh, and it's got sort of patchy distribution. It's found in really wet sites and deep canyons uh, in the Southwest. 
uh, so from Utah uh, all the way down into Texas and Mexico. Um, it's got beautiful fall colors. And of course, our uh, dominant maples are, are in the eastern, uh, eastern North America, especially in the United States. Uh, so red maple, Acer rubrum, uh, has a wide distribution from Florida to Canada and uh, from the Mississippi to the Atlantic coast. Acer saccharum or sugar maple, also a pretty wide distribution, but a little bit more north and east. Uh, Acer saccharum, this or saccharanum, this is silver maple. So this is originally a species on floodplains uh, of mostly the Midwest and Northeast. Uh, it's been widely planted as a as an urban and suburban uh, street tree. So we'll see we see them around Denver uh, all the time. Um, also in the temperate zone, we have birch. Uh, we, we talked about birch in the boreal forest. Uh, you'll find birch, especially in the northeast, down the axis of the Appalachian Mountains at sort of higher elevations. Um, and then there's many, many others. Uh, so the temperate deciduous forest is, is really species rich. Uh, so we've got ash and elm, walnut, sycamore, tulip tree, sweet gum, black gum, cherry, and, and many more. So, I mean, you could talk about the eastern deciduous forest as it's this sort of monolithic thing, but really, uh, it's re very diverse uh, if, you, if you look at a finer geographic scale. Um, and you can see here, this is the uh, forest types of e eastern North America um, as developed by um, Lucy Braun. E. Lucy Braun was uh, a really great botanist uh, and ecologist. She was the first woman um, elected president of the Ecological Society of America, and she wrote a seminal work, uh, The Eastern Deciduous Forest, in, in 1950. And it's really a great, great uh, piece of ecology, talking about the different forest types, the different species in different parts of North America. And so this is really going to be our guide. Uh, this, and of course, we're going to go farther west too. Um, this is going to be our guide for how we break up our species and how we look at the arboretum and study these different species. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna look at you know different forest types. So for instance, you know the boreal oak, hickory, um, you know mixed mesophytic beech maple, and so on. And we'll focus on a few species from each of those types uh, each of the days that we're out on the arboretum doing our dendrology lessons. Uh, so this is uh, hopefully a um, a pretty thorough but but somewhat quick overview of. Uh, the the forests uh, forest types, especially of North America, the boreal, and the uh, temperate.